and the clock announced the arrival of our next speaker, Rune Klevier, from, uh, also from University of Bergen, from the Department of uh, Media Science and Information Studies. Uh, let us welcome Rune. Um, I'll try and um, I'll try and read um, a short short version of the paper that I've uploaded as a PDF on the website. I don't have a printer, so I'll read it from my phone if you don't mind. Um, um, in video games, what would the concept of a diegetic world be referring to? Um, can we put this idea to productive use in the theory and philosophy of games? And if so, how should we define it? The standard definition, definition of the diegetic, uh, which is most influential in, in film theory, <clears throat> can be intuitively grasped. The diegesis of a novel or a film, Gerald, uh, Gerald Prince and David Ward will explain, is the fictional world in, in which the events of the story unfold. Intuitively, in our imagination, we think of this world as existing um, independently of its telling. There's nothing here. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we imagine characters, um, not as characters, but as persons, as people. This intuitive idea allows fil film students to discuss diegetic versus non-diegetic music, and it may also lead them to conclude that the characters in Tom Hooper's Le Miserable, probably from 2012, uh, probably not are people who live in a world in which talk doesn't exist and so on. You're probably familiar with those kinds of discussions. Um, diegetic worlds do not only appear to exist independently of their telling, they also appear to exist independently of our emotional engagement with them. Their existence as imagined actual worlds do not seem to depend very much on things like identification or immersion. Take Peggy Olsen, for example. Oh, let's see if I have a... Take Peggy Olsen, for example. Uh, anyone who's familiar with Peggy Olsen? Yeah, quite a few people, okay. Um, in a conversation, anyone who has seen Mad Men may happily go on to discuss what she's like and maybe check her family background on Wikipedia. Uh, her real name is, by the way, is, uh, is not Peggy, but Margaret, and she's of, uh, or her dad is, is Norwegian, uh, a Norwegian Lutheran, and her, and her mom is an Irish Catholic. Um, and that's why she's a Catholic called Olsen in, uh, in The Mad Men. Um, there is no need to immerse ourselves uh, to do this. Hang on, I have a... We seemingly snap into diegetic mode, as if by a secret signal um, or a secret logic. Games use a range of established and well-known media forms as means to evoke our diegetic imagination. The new kid on the block, however, is graphical real-time environments, which I will here call uh, virtual environments. Um, come to think of it now, virtual environments in, in this context is just a, a kind of handle that I'm using. And it's, it's a very dry concept, so maybe it's better, if, maybe if you want, you can change this for for uh, like Avatar, or maybe even better, the, the ludic subject that Daniel was talking about, uh, our, our project within the game that, that you were talking about, a project of selfhood or whatever, yeah, the, uh, that would probably work better at what I'm getting at. So maybe try and forget this dry technical term of virtuality and um, imagine Dan Daniel saying uh, ludic subject, maybe. Maybe. But anyway. Um, one could say, uh, plausibly, that hands-on engagement with real-time environments is a diegetic super-generator. 
that it, contrib that it contributes very strongly to evoking a diegetic world due to its perceptually immediate and immersive qualities. Let us call this view the continuity model of the relationship uh, between virtual environments and diegetic worlds. And here in the paper, there's more about the continuity model in light of Bob Rehack, uh, Galloway, and so on, but I'll skip that. The continuity model implies that we see uh, graphical environments as virtualizations of the diegetic imagination. And in his book, Video Game Spaces, uh, Michael Nietzsche sees this duality as a happy marriage of gaming and cinema. And I quote from, from, uh, from Michael Nietzsche, as the audience steps through the screen into the world behind, they take the camera with them and enter into a continuous, navigable, diegetic world like a never-ending film set. And the camera remains a nar narrative device. The player experiences game spaces in a combination of both, continuous, navigable space and cinematic space. So a diegetic world, according to this understanding, is not only realized, but augmented and as such revitalized um, through its virtualization in real-time graphical environments. And the continuity model also sits well with the common idea that gaming in virtual environments uh, is like being in a movie. Um, like being in a movie. The alternative view which can be taken from the works of Espen Orschett, Christine Jürgensen and others, myself included, is that virtual env environments are not imagined and therefore entirely distinct from diegetic worlds. <clears throat> so there is no mention here of the narrative structure or process. The theatrical performance brings about an existence that is given, clearly evident to the mind. This existence, this universe, can be conjured up in two different ways, according to Sorio. Uh, the classical stage architecture, Sorio proposes, is a tiny cube cut out from an imagined universe. This cube, this nucleus, exerts its power, its authority over the audience through, through the principle of spectatorship. Alternatively, the theatrical performance can conjure such an imagined universe through the principle of the sphere, which is not about spectatorship but it's an invitation to play along, to be immersed, to take part, or we could say, um, I may be stretching Surio a bit here, but we could say role play. Um, yes, cubes to sit. But if this is not a process of narration, conveying the unfolding of events in time, then what kind of act is it? What is the general principle at work in diegetic imagination? How am I doing for time, by the way? Okay. Um, Remigius Bunia, or Bunia, Bunia, um, in his discussion of, of Jeanette's concept of, of diegesis, argues that the intuitive givenness and fullness of diegetic worlds is rooted in a general concept of worldness, <coughs> a general concept of what it means to be a world. Bunia refers to this as world semantics. And I quote from, from, from Bunia, the concept of world makes us assume that a truthful description of the world is possible. And in this sense, world semantics requires not only the real world, but every fictional world to be coherent and complete. Coherence and completeness uh, complement each other. Coherence excludes contradictory descriptions, while completeness means that nothing fundamentally resists description. This is from Bunya, who, who draws on and discusses uh, Etienne Siro's uh, concept of diegesis. On this account, the world it is the world semantics that allows us to evoke out of thin air from a tiny fragment a world as given and as complete. So I would su suggest in the following that what Surya and Bunya is, Surya and Bunya is talking about is a very particular kind of fiction rooted in a very particular kind of pretense. So I'll quickly do Searle, it's a longer bit on John Searle in the paper, but in the logical status of fictional discourse, um, according to John Searle, Surya's presentations of actors on stage, whether as cube or as sphere, uh, is um, a particular kind of speech act, namely an act of pretended reference. Uh, our secret signal or logic 
is that we pretend to be referring to real people. Um, the idea of a fictional world then, for Searle, in my interpretation, follows from the idea of a fictional person. A person is a person in a world. Um, and this, this uh, we're now into the, into the Jigglypuff territory here, I guess, in, in, uh, in, in terms of uh, <laughs> referencing by proper names or, or by, by uh, species predicates. So, yeah. <clears throat> um, so, in, so we leave Searle for the moment. And in, in Truth in Fiction, David Lewis, he also suggests that fiction is constituted through pretended reference. Uh, he offers a possible world account of the nature of this act of pretended reference. Um, so this is David Lewis's uh, possible world, world account. Uh, the worlds we should consider, I suggest, are the worlds where the fiction is told, but as known fact rather than fiction. So unlike other non-actual possible worlds, like counterfactuals, for example, like other non-actual possible worlds, a fictional, fictional non-actual world is told from a position within it, a position from which the storyteller is referring to actual people and events. This world is imagined as being our world, our reality, and a useful word for this kind of immersion in the logical sense is recentering. Uh, I take that from, from Mary Laura Ryan. Um, in diegetic fiction, we recenter our position. Uh, we recenter our position so that a non-actual possible world becomes temporarily our new epistemological center, our actual world. So this is Ryan, as I take it, interpreting Lewis, um, or interpreting a pretense account of fiction. So with respect to Bunya's interpretation of, of diegesis, the key difference here is in the position from which one evokes uh, the assumption of a world semantics. The point is to be able to signal and to be able to pick up the signal of a very particular kind of pretense agreement, I suggest. Through an explicit or, expli or, explicit or ex implicit uh, cons constitutive act we establish that what will follow is the true recounting of events. In this act, this game, we establish with authority the logic of pretended real-world reference. Uh, whenever we refer back to um, fictional worlds, as, to a fictional world as if it was our actual world, as we may do when we discuss Peggy Olsen, or as a, a few of us may do here when we discuss Peggy Olsen, we evoke the diegetic pretense, um, or maybe in some sense the virtual act that you talked about yesterday, Daniel. We evoke the diegetic pretense, we reactivate uh, the game, however fleetingly and <coughs> shiftingly, one could say. Also, thank you. Uh, well, no, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Oli. I'll continue. The, the best is yet to come. Um. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> this constitutive act must not be confused with the idea of suspension of disbelief in the psychological and emotional sense, something we often refer to as narrative immersion, which is contingent and gradual um, and closely linked to the machinery of narrative process nor should it be confused with uh, immersion in the perceptual sense, which is obviously a completely different kind of thing. <laughs> <coughs> obviously. Um, so what does the concept of diegetic pretense imply for computer game theory? This is a work in progress, so the part I'm doing now is the most progressy of the work in progress part. Uh, going back to the context of, of Sura's theatrical stage, it is not the stage itself that evokes the logic of an asif actual world uh, or the film set, but a particular act of presentation, some kind of implicit or explicit statement that constitutes the game of diegetic pretense. In games, virtual environments or your life project, the, the, the project or the ludic subject or whatever, uh, can be used as a medium for diegetic imagination like any other, but then someone needs to speak or present in a certain way. Someone needs to assume the authority to portray events in Lewis's terms as known facts. 
the divide between diegetic worlds and, and virtual environments is not a matter of technological, I've written that so that you can get it, not a matter of te <coughs> technological limitations. Uh, in order to be able to constitute and uphold a diegetic game or make-believe, games depend on either some kind of theatrical or cinematic staging or mechanisms that encourage and support imaginative role-playing, either the cube or the sphere in Etienne Soro's um, uh, language. More sophisticated AI or more, more lively facial animations is not going to affect the difference at the ontological level between world understood as uh, environment, virtual environment, or physical environment in Disneyland for that matter, a virtual environment, and world understood as Recentered world semantics, which is a completely different concept of worldness. Um, accordingly, virtual characters, whether they are player controlled or AI controlled, are ontologically separate from diegetic characters, just like actors are separate from the characters they play. There are no troublesome dissonance between Ellie, the AI agent in The Last of Us, and Ellie, the, the, the person in the world of The Last of Us. They simply just disconnect, juxtaposition. We can use AI agents or playable characters or figures, avatars, to project imagined um, persons in the same way that we can use actors or robots to project imagined persons. But the actor, the NPC or the avatar figure, <coughs> going again from Daniel here, the avatar figure, is not itself that person. Peggy Olsen could never be among us here today, even if Elizabeth Moss could, because Peggy Olsen does not exist. Equally, Ellie, the AI agent, or the NPC, does exist, but the person Ellie does not. If you as a game designer, um, hello Google, um, if you as a game designer find this lack of existence in Ellie, the AI agent, if you find this lack of existence troublesome or artistically frustrating, then I'm sorry, technology can't help you. You can en engage your place in the game of diegetic imagination uh, so that your Elliot Joel come alive as real people with the past and the future. But then the virtual environment must be a medium of imaginative authorship or a medium of presentation because Ellie, the real existing AI agent, must act her part um, in such a way that the player either plays along or goes into spectatorship mode. If not, then anything that Ellie the agent or Joel the player figure might be doing in the game environment is disconnected from and irrelevant to the person's Ellie and Joe, just like whatever Elizabeth Moth might be doing is irrelevant to the description of the person, Peggy Olsen. Um, very quickly, a couple of aesthetic implications. First, um, within the broad tradition of action and adventure uh, genres of gaming, the default paradigm from Pac-Man on, onwards, is not of the diegetic kind. Uh, in games, as in other media, characters do not have to be imagined as part of a complete actual world in the way we imagine Peggy Olsen. In this respect, it seems to me that Mario is roughly on the same ontological kind as early computer therapist uh, Eliza, and, um, or Borat on David Letterman, or possibly Tom and Jerry. Uh, these are non-diegetic characters. They have no past and no future, um, sort of an ad hoc existence and they live their life always in the present and we engage with them in the presence in the here and now of virtual and physical environments. Arguably, characters like Eco, Yoda, uh, also belong to this category. Uh, this category of characters, um, no past, no future, uh, characters living a lifetime during our playtime. Um, um, this is Dantley, or this is probably also um, um, the case in Eco, even though there's a diegetic aspect which comes as a sort of a, uh, a hint of the of the beyond in Eco, the, that's a different. Uh, so, finally, if we see this as a matter of juxtaposition rather than continuity, we can analyze how games like, for example, The Last of Us, stage a dialogue across the ontological divide. In essence, the gap that separates us from the story world during play is the same gap that separates our lives from the fictional worlds of novels, films, and games. I'll therefore, very finally, <coughs> speculate that games of this sort, 
with heavy, heavy use of cutscenes and so on, they reconstruct uh, um, within themselves the general relation uh, between life and diegesis in a compressed and artificially staged form. Traveling with Ellie and Joel is like traveling around the world in 80 days in the manner described in the novel while reading the novel. There would be an absolute ontological separation between you and Phileas Fogg, uh, but also a companionship, a direct uh, resonance uh, with the real life experience of your own uh, adventure. And finally, thank you. Thank you, Rone. We do have time for questions. Any questions? <coughs> then let me ask a question about the cross media. Point you at the direction of cross media storytelling. Mm. I had to watch the Tomb Raider movie where I learned that Lara Croft knows how to ski because her grandfather lives in the Alps. Mm. And as a kid, she learned to ski there. Yeah. That knowledge is utterly useless for playing any Tomb Raider game. Yes. I'm not sure where the question is, but maybe you can yeah. take it from me. <laughs> no, I, I think that you point to, if we look at those types of games that have this uh, cinematic mode of presentation prominently, and, who, and which try to stage this kind of dialogue uh, with a completely different world, which is completely different from Maybe our, I'm referring to uh, games where the movie exists of the same subject. Yeah, 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 I'm getting it. Yeah. Okay. The games that do that, that's how you have this sort of self-project within the game and you have this other kind of, you know, digestious thing, which is... Then most of those games in the commercial, you know, the big games, they, uh, they do that and they, they do that in a way that already evoke this universe uh, which as a pre-existing thing. You know, so the transmedia, there's a lot of discussion in literature on diegesis and transmedia that I guess one could tap into there mm. about how, uh, you know, what are the conditions for making true statements about the transmedia world and how do we assess when the transmedia world is incoherent or not and so on. But that, that, that's a bigger discussion. But games obviously uh, pull up that out as a very important uh, resource when they stage this kind of uh, resonance between uh, a compressed life project within the game and and something uh, that is existing in a alternate <laughs> alternate universe in a way yeah and daniel has a question yeah, um so thanks for that um, I, I found it very um, engaging I have a couple of questions, actually. And um, the first one relates to um, your comment, which I think uh, I agree with, that we don't need to speak about immersion specifically. Uh, this, this kind of diegetic engagement is separate from the sense of immersion. Mm. Um, I think I agree with that. Um, let you then draw on Ryan's concept of recentering mm. as a means of describing the diegetic mode of engagement. But mm. now for Ryan, recentering is precisely the cognitive mechanism that leads to a sense of immersion. Yeah. Right? Um, so I was wondering if you could comment on you know, how we then yeah. separate the idea of recentering from the idea of immersion. Yeah. Well, I don't know ex exactly, this is a work in progress, mm -hmm. but, progress but my working idea is that um, recentering in the lodge or the sort of possible world sense or, or for John Searle, the logical sense, you know, the logical fiction. Recentering is, is in, we can see that as a condition for what might then unfold as a process of narration, of immersion, of, you know, uh, engagement. But the, but the recentering itself, I guess I understand in somewhat, in, in a similar way as, as Daniel talked about virtual act that this, this recentering can take place in a conversation back and forth without noticing it. You know, this, the, the, this talking about a fictional character as a real character. Like, like if you say, oh, Peggy Olsen's dad is, is uh, or father is Norwegian, and you might say, oh, is he? You know, 
which is a completely ludicrous answer. But, but, but it, it is imaginable that you would answer that. So then we kind of switch into that mode, then we might s switch back again. So, so it's in that sense, but whether, whether you can say that this is independent, we can understand this purely through logic and independently of cognitive mechanisms and so on. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I haven't. That's. I, I'm not making any claims. I mean, it's an interesting point to consider because it does lead to a more kind of specific understanding of these mechanisms than immersion does, which is obviously quite a vague and all-encompassing. Yeah, yeah. 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 This is in a sense immersion in the logical sense, <laughs> if you could say that. Logical immersion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> logical. Yeah. yeah. Um, Oh, well, there were more questions. Oh, yeah. I I <coughs> oh. Would you like to turn off your mic, please? <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. I think Peter had a question. Thanks. Um, uh, this might be a, a stupid question, but to, to take a sort of absurd example where um, characters uh, are extended through a sort of a canon like James Bond, where mm. James Bond fan communities debate all the sort of um, logical inconsistencies of both mm. his age, you know, his parents, whether James Bond is, there's a fan theory that says that James Bond mm. is a name that's given to the spy because there's so many inconsistencies in his yeah, yeah, yeah. But it then is re-adjudicated through every film, mm. irrespective of what happened in the books, mm. and then every now and then in a computer game. Um, mm. Does that... How does that play into the sort of diegetic world of this? Yeah, that's a, that, really that, that kind of that, that complicates the picture. What I'm trying to get at here eventually, but which I haven't really gotten around to yet, is to try and formulate some theory of non diegetic characters. I guess Mario is one, or I imagine Borat when he's with Letterman. These characters that, that exist and are just here now with us and have no past, no future, and, and, and we don't start asking those. We don't start those discussions. Oh, dad, where did he come from? Or how come he is young now? He was old ten years ago, and all other kinds of things, because they're just in the moment, you know. Uh, but I don't have a theory of non-diegetic characters. But if I had, I would say that maybe James. Then I could start. Okay, we have non clearly non-diegetic characters, and we have clearly very diegetic characters. On the other hand, like Harry Potter, for example. And then we have fan fiction and all kinds of things that place with stuff. Tom and Jerry, maybe. So maybe, maybe James Bond would... Maybe I would pull James Bond towards the sort of non-diegetic side of it, towards the Tom and Jerry. You know, Tom and Jerry can be in the Middle Ages and slaughter dragons, and then they're in the Olympic Games the day after, and then the old, they are the only two contestants in the Olympic... It, it doesn't make any sense, you know? They, they just pro project worlds ad hoc based on their characters. You completely, they turn around on a dime, you know, so, so, so I would probably pull that transmedia and fan fiction James Bond in that direction, if I had a theory of non-diegetic characters, which I don't. Yeah. And in the interest of time, this is where we will stop. Thank you. Thank you.